welcome to our first ever NIFA conference. This is online. My name is Lingol and I am from SCAPE. This program is brought to you by SCAPE. Our program partners are Singapore International Film Festival, the National Youth Council, media partner Media Corp, and this is a project supported by the Lin SG Seed Fund. So, to you at home, well, I'm at home too. Thank you for choosing to spend your Friday with us. Uh, we've had a very exciting session so far. It's been uh, three sessions down. This is the second last one. Just to share a little bit more about NIFA that we call, well, we call it NIFA, but otherwise it's the National Youth Film Awards. It's a program where we get you to come together as a community. I think it's just nice that uh, even during this circuit breaker season, that we get to be online, to have conversations, to still be connected and to be in touch with uh, some of these industry professionals that even while we're kept at home, we are not losing contact, we're not losing touch. So keep your questions coming. Um, and if you have anything that you'd like to share with us, feel free to drop us an email at NYFA, N-Y-F-A, at skate.sg. Now you've seen uh, today, we're talking about getting the right screens for your short film. So now that you've completed your short film, what's next? Well, actually, what they say is, is the beginning, right? Um, it's really interesting that uh, the, the panel that we have today because uh, they're going to share some tips with you on uh, film programming and the uh, festival circuit. We've got a very good representation on the panel today. So come, let me introduce you to whom we have. First up, we have Ming, the programming director for SGIFF. Thank you, Ming. Thank you for taking time to be with us. And, and we have Prashan. Prashan is uh, the general manager for the projector. And then we have Raylan. Uh, media Development Consultant from Honor SG and Nikki, Nikki Look, Digital Content Lead from Vitsi. Hi guys. Okay, so John, maybe you can share more with us on today's topic. Yes, we are on session four. Um, I would say that uh, this session four is a completion of a cycle uh, from since this morning. Um, if you had been following us from the morning, we talked a bit about content which is crowdsourcing content. We also talked a bit about up-and-coming trends. Uh, then and at 3 o'clock, we also spoke about um, opportunities, which is scholarships and overseas education. Uh, now we shall talk about platforms for you, the filmmaker. And hopefully, you know, from the panel that we have actually assembled, we can answer your questions about which platform is best for my film, um, what kind of things I should prepare for a festival, you know, if I want to hire a venue, what sort of uh, details should I actually take uh, and, and take note of? And um, interestingly enough, if I want and if I like an end-to-end -end solution, uh, what organization should I work with? Uh, we have got, you know, platforms here from, you know, a traditional independent cinema to a film festival uh, to an initiative, a uh, non-profit initiative, and also uh, online platforms. So welcome, guys. Um, if you have read the bios and the descriptions, um, I think most of us uh, may find uh, Honor SG, the Honor Initiative, uh, pretty new and pretty fresh. Uh, but in fact, the Honor Initiative by Honor SG has been around, uh, again, if I'm not wrong, for, for already five years. Uh, we will be more than happy to hear more uh, about Honor from uh, Railing. So I would like actually Railing to kick off the conversation uh, by introducing to us uh, the Honor Initiative platform as an end-to-end solution for a filmmaker to be able to actually create, pitch, make, and actually screen your short films and then some. So uh, please, Raylene, maybe you can bring us through Honor. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for the invitation and for having me on this panel. Uh, of course, I must say, in the interest of full disclosure, John is also on our <laughs> Honor Pitch panel. So thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Um, so as John was saying, basically what we have in the Honor Film Initiative is really an end-to-end -end platform uh, where we identify authentic stories that filmmakers have we commission them, we review the films, um, you know, and then we showcase um, the good ones, um, both at our signature event, which is the Honor Film Screening that is already into its 10th season, um, as well as online through our social media channels. 
Um, thereafter, we actually uh, distribute them um, at uh, various, I mean, screen and, and showcase them at various um, uh, platforms, including the honor learning journey that goes into the secondary schools and JCs. Um, so in the five years since our inception in 2015, um, the Honor Film Initiative has actually commissioned uh, more than 120 films. Um, and we've heard uh, close to 200 pitches to date. Uh, of which um, half or slightly more than half uh, were actually uh, commissioned and funded. So kind of uh, every year we commission about 25 films, uh, of which rough, roughly half would be selected for the honor film screening. So again, the selection rate is about half. Um, and our criteria is that the theme of the short film must be about honor. So your intent must be to honor someone or something or an experience that you've had. Um, so many of our filmmakers actually dig deep inside them to tell a story of honor out of their own experiences of pain and brokenness. And uh, I think it's really about finding the honor, the love, the redemption in the things that have brokenness. Um, and that clarity of intent is what really makes a, a, a film a, a great honor story. Uh, we believe that a story that comes from the heart uh, touches the heart. So it's no coincidence that many of these stories um, are the, you know, the ones that come from the heart, are the ones that end up resonating most uh, with our audiences. Uh, so we've had uh, a number of notable successes. I just want to mention a few uh, to give credit to our filmmakers. Uh, Pencil by Gina Tan won the NIFA Best Screenplay and Best Picture Award. Uh, when the Stars Align by Brenda Err is a film about Singapore's first uh, three female Olympians. And it's, it's, it's become, in that sense, a, quite, quite a classic. Uh, Lullaby by Stanley Shi, who has been showcased at more than nine film festivals ar around the world. And a few others have been showcased at SGIFF, including Builders and Stitches. Um, so basically today we work across four institutions of higher learning. Uh, Nian Polytechnic is our uh, national lead partner, and it's, it is where it all started. Um, there's, um, also, of course, uh, Tomasic Poly, Republic Poly, and uh, LaSalle College of the Arts. Thank you, Raylene. I think uh, it's actually good to know that, you know, organizations such as Honor, you know, who I would say comprise of people who see uh, the big picture, um, are actually interested in using film to actually uh, show and demonstrate meaning and, um, you know, to a certain extent, pay it forward, you know, certain meaningful values. Um, I'd like to maybe turn attention to Prashant, the projector, you know, which is, you know, Singapore's easily leading and, you know, I dare say still surviving public independent cinema. Um, and projector was started off also very, very much um, ideally for filmmakers who want to watch, you know, alternative films and not just Hollywood fanfare. Um, for those of you who don't know Projector, perhaps, you know, Prashant, you could actually roughly just mention, you know, uh, and give us an overview of the independent cinema. Sure. Um, so Projector runs a three-hall cinema in Golden Mile Tower. Um, we are about five years old now. Oh, sorry, slightly over five years old. Um, we started out actually as a crowdfunding initiative. So there was an abandoned cinema. They were the originally the circle seats of uh, Golden Theatre, which was built in 1970s. Uh, they had been abandoned for a while. Uh, we kind of found them in a bit of a disused state. Um, so there was a Kickstarter or Indiegogo project uh, that galvanized about $70,000 to help, uh, you know, pay for all the equipment and everything. So it was actually really a community project in a way that uh, resulted in the creation of the cinema five years ago. Um, since then, a lot of uh, blood, sweat and tears have gone in to make it sustainable, <laughs> uh, which, yeah, which is great because, uh, you know, without an audience, we wouldn't have been able to survive uh, the way uh, we, we have grown since then. Uh, we see about 10,000 people a month coming to the cinema, which okay. is something that we never imagined at that point. Um, and in terms of getting an audience for such a diverse slate of films, uh, not just your commercial kind of mainstream films uh, or bigger studio titles, but also very small, uh, you know, foreign language films that we wouldn't have imagined would have gotten an audience to fill a 200-seater hall. Uh, but 
clearly there's a local interest uh, in people wanting to experience that on a big screen. Um, so we're definitely heartened by that. You mentioned to me that uh, the start of this year was Projector's most successful run. Yes, uh, it's, it's definitely our highest grossing box office uh, in the last five years. So it was uh, you know, a great start to the year. <laughs> and then uh, some other things put a stop to it. So, and you know, March was the first time we ever closed uh, and not screened for a, you know, a long period of time. So, um, but we are, I mean, even though the cinemas are closed, we are looking at some other options in terms of the online space and, and how we can still continue to engage our audience um, mm -hmm. and, and you know give them. So we've run like Insta story competitions for our audience and we're also talking to um, indie distributors like Anticipate to try and push their content which is available on streaming now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's still a mark of, of uh, great success to be able to say that, you know, Singaporean audiences are looking for greater and better alternatives, you know, to enjoy cinema. Um, it's 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 a lot about taste making, as I always say. Um, more yeah. than filmmaking itself, in many many ways, how you can grow that community. Um, maybe we turn our attention to to Vitsi. You know, Vitsi, Vitsi, as we all know, it has has been um, started off kind of like the same way. I think. Uh, I mean, again, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Nikki. That Vitsi was actually started as kind of like a community to watch short films together. And from that, you know, digital startup kind of model, it has now evolved to becoming a community of filmmakers and their films. And uh, it has also become almost like a studio with its broadcast platform possibilities. Um, I mean, how did this start off, you know, in the early days, Nikki? Yeah, I'd be happy to share this, uh, even though I'm not one of the co-founders, uh, but maybe just a brief background. Uh, so it started off with our co-founders, uh, both Jian and Derek. Uh, they were from New Studios, so it's a film club uh, in the NUS, uh, and they were rallying the community for sharing of films first. So they came from engineering backgrounds uh, with experience in working at telco companies and startups, uh, but they both shared a common love for films. Uh, so imagine it like a, almost like a marriage between technology and films, right? Uh, and so the platform was born. Uh, and as we also experienced it ourselves, uh, many of us coming from filmmaking backgrounds, uh, we understood the pain of finding distribution and also the great potential it has for today's audience. Lah. So short films, we realize, often lose steam after initial rounds of distribution. Uh, and in today's competitive, like, Content, content space uh, with the rise of like TikTok and all these digital platforms, uh, it may be hard to get attention as a single short film or as an aspiring filmmaker. So since the early days, we have come a long way uh, to then uh, bring across that concept of uh, bringing the world of cinema to you, to the audience. Uh, and there's always that core mission of empowering storytellers in what we do. Um, so building up the community, we, we are able to offer strength in numbers uh, where as a curated collective, we can then find new audiences and opportunities together. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think the nice, nice key word here is actually curated collective. Um, a lot of times we cannot rule out the fact that you know, curators and film programmers uh, play a crucial part in almost you know, shaping the audience and actually giving the audience some form of expectation of entertainment or of course you know, filmic patronage to to, to, to themselves and you know, to the cinema. Um, I mean, I mean, to this effect, um, we also have to recognize the the efforts, you know, of uh, SGIFF, you know, going on to its, uh, if I'm not wrong, 31st year this year. Uh, and we are very, very uh, happy to know that uh, Ming is able to join us also on this chat. Um, maybe Ming, you can actually talk a bit about SGIFF, uh, but I don't think anybody here doesn't know about SGIFM already. So maybe yeah, just a short introduction. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe some of you have been a uh, kind of longer term uh, audience than me. Um, but anyway, yes, uh, SGIF will be uh, celebrating its 31st uh, edition this year. We're still planning as usual. Uh, for this year, uh, the festival will be held from 26th of November till 6th of December. And uh, I think uh, for you guys who have been to SGF, uh, some of the program you may be interested in and have been watching are um, Asian feature competition 
were the uh, Southeast Asian short film competition, but uh, more re more importantly and more relevant to the filmmaker here are uh, Singapore panoramas. So in a sense, um, SGF has always show and championed um, Singapore content and not just the on-screen um, films that everyone can enjoy with the audience, but um, we also have film academies such as um, Film Lab, where the youth juries and critics programmed and uh, film found and things like that to encourage uh, and support uh, the young and upcoming filmmakers and film critics uh, from the um, from this region, from Singapore and from Southeast Asia. And I think what's really inspiring and what I really like from last year was that um, I get to see so many audience that um, they all came around and I see, I gradually see familiar faces after each screening. I mean, people really go to trying to attend as many screenings as possible and people gather around, talk about films. And I think even though those films are not made by me, but um, as I found as the programmer, once you select the film, there's something you also want to share with the audience. So uh, for me, I really look forward to seeing the audience. Uh, when they go in, I would be very happy to see so many audience come and watch the film. And when they get out, I, I usually, if I can, I usually stay outside. And I sometimes feel a bit um, nervous because I don't know if the audience would come out and crying or <laughs> feeling happy or they're going to hate the film and they're going to say, who select this film? I'm going to complain to him or her. So it, but it, it's very exciting. I think as long as there are many audience go to watch the film and um, we have conversations and think about those films uh, and find it. Also, I think what's quite important is during the film festival, you find a companion, you realize that um, people also like this kind of film and you feel you're not alone. Because I think sometimes people who doesn't, um, who want to watch things beyond um, what kind of studio Hollywood films uh, there, sometimes you can feel a bit lonely because it's probably a little, a little bit difficult to find people to go to cinema with you. But then when you go to film festival for that week or 10 days, it's all your, it's your, your, all your partners. People love, love yeah. these films. Yeah. So I think it's a very nice uh, community feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a very tribal thing, if you may, you know, or if I may use the word, you know, to enjoy. I, I'm trying to expand that. I think, <laughs> I think, yes, I mean, it, it can be a niche interest, but then at the same time, um, everyone wants to be accepted in a way. So, mm -hmm. yes, maybe there aren't that many people, like kind of 100,000 or a million people out there, but... Um, we still have a lot of opportunity to expand, to encourage people, like encourage your friend, come and try, and to share those joys you had when you watch those films with them. And we can grow this community together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good segue for me to actually ask a very general question to all, all the programmers here. And I'm expecting that this question will probably reply some of the questions uh, that we have, which we will, of course, circle back. Um, so the question I would actually pose to you guys is, what what do you guys look for, you know, in a film, and how 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 would my film get selected to be played, let's say, uh, you know, on honor on at the projector at VC or SGIFF? Um, maybe Prashan, you can start. How do I actually go to the projector and say, hey, screen my film, or if I can in the first place? Sure. <laughs> so for us, I've been, our focus is still largely feature films. Um, you know, short films are really not something that we're looking at programming, largely because uh, we have no way to remunerate filmmakers that way. Like with the feature films, it's quite clear distribution model. We pay the distributors a uh, ticket and consumers who are purchasing for features will generally just pay an, a certain fixed ticket price. Um, and then that split goes to distributors. So to add on, you know, short films as a precursor largely has been by exception. We've done so with, say, Benjamin's uh, Last Day at Katong or recently Celery Day with Our Dream of Singapore. But it was because we found certain elements that would uh, be interesting for the audience. 
Uh, so for us, largely, if we're talking about short films itself, it's really if there's a unique point of view. Um, Celery Day, for example, was a short film done by a migrant worker on a shoestring budget. And so even though production quality may not have been very high, but the messages that were coming through or the insight into that life was quite important for us to be able to profile it uh, prior to I Dream of Singapore. So for us, um, so for us also, that's the assessment. Uh, we are a commercial entity. So for us to uh, use a commercial slot to screen this particular film, there are certain you know, ROIs that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so the marketability of the film and also whether it speaks to the specific demographics that we think that we can communicate. And then also if it ticks certain programming boxes for us, which is more on like you know, diversity, inclusivity, inclusivity and such, then, you know, we'll program that. Um, so, I mean, which is why a lot of people sometimes come to us as like, oh, you must support local. Uh, but, you know, that to me is with caveat. Uh, okay. Even, you know, when we support local, it needs to be for us commercially viable. Um, mm -hmm. So we do, we will try and find a platform for you, but it doesn't mean that we are obliged to be able to, you know, screen all future films that are produced. Um, yeah, for us, there is also a certain quality marks that we look for. Uh, and if there isn't, then whether there are redeeming factors in terms of, you know, points of view and such that we can help profile and, and platform these movies. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it's good to know that every cinema has its own branding and, and, and its own identity. I, I, th I think that also shapes a certain level of expectation uh, for the audience uh, who buys the ticket to watch it in a certain cinema. Yeah, yeah. so that's right. I mean, there's a certain expectation in terms of the curation. So in a way, we cannot unleash all films onto our audience. In a way, it's not, it's not fair for us. Uh, so for us, it's, it's all carefully curated and we do communicate why we think this film is cool or why you should watch it and, and that kind of thing. So um, for us, it, it does go through quite a strict uh, curatorial, uh, you know, like a lot, our team of four always discusses and decides, like, even if it's an art house film, like, what does it mean when we screen a, a film like this? And, and how do we communicate that to our audience? Otherwise, uh, we lose the trust of our audience also if we, you know, yes. just screen anything that has been produced in a way. That, that's actually a valid point. And, and, and I'm very glad. And I hope this is also echoed throughout the, the discussion um, because, again, whatever it is, filmmaking is still a consumer product, you know, um, yeah. be, it, be it a very esoteric art house film or a mainstream film. You know, you always have to communicate a meaning um, and, and that's irrefutable. And I, I think it's, it's great that you guys are echoing this. Um, Nikki, I would like you to talk a bit about uh, Vitsi and how Vitsi acquires uh, the short films because I think um, you know I've seen Vitsi grown you know from new studios days until now and the entire spirit of sharing and also uh, being part of the community has always been that premise uh, but again you know when when organizations grow bigger there's always that accountability of QC um, perhaps you can actually talk a bit about how does VC actually choose their films and curate them? Yeah, in terms of uh, curation, uh, I think echoing what Prashan said uh, is for the audience, right? And uh, as a platform like us, um, we have four pillars of curation guidelines. Uh, so the first one, we're looking at story. Uh, mainly it's the clarity of message, the consistency in the story premise. How, how is the overall execution of the story? Uh, so we put story at the top. Uh, and then the second one is production quality, uh, looking at the little, little elements in the film, like cinematography, art design, etc., in supporting the story. And then the third pillar is accessibility. Uh, how relevant is that story to mainstream audiences? How universal are the themes or topics in the story? Does it need like local nuances or context to it? And then the fourth pillar, uh, we coined it shareability. <laughs> it's not a word, uh, but it comes from the term shareable. Uh, so what do audiences get out of the story? Like, is there a larger message out of it? Will audiences be motivated to share it with their friends or families? Uh, so based on these four pillars, uh, our team then reviews all the submissions coming in. Yeah. Sorry, Joanne, you're muted. Muted. 
Okay, so four pillars decided by by a group of what five people, six people, or yeah. So I work alongside a team of uh, content community managers. Uh, sometimes we wear the hat of curation. Sometimes we wear the hat of programming. Mm. Uh, but yeah, we we have uh, we're taking care of the communities right now in Singapore, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I, just now, Raylin, you mentioned also the clarity of intent. Um, I'm assuming that is uh, almost a priority for the Honor Initiative to actually have their film screen. Uh, would there be any other criteria that you know Honor would look at for a screening? You know that you guys organize yourselves. Um, sure. Um, basically, I think we're looking at uh, three key elements: uh, excellence in storytelling, um, and usually that. Um, you know, that it has to be uh, clear, it has to be authentic, um, and really um, the, the best ones, I think, come, come straight from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the excellence in production, um, and then in amplifying the value of, of honour, you know, um, kind of uh, shedding light on what that looks like, mm -hmm. uh, what that feels like, what that mm -hmm. sounds like. So I think those, those are the key things for us. Um, and a plus point, um, especially for the ones that we share online, would be stories that are relevant to our society. Um, so just now I just answered a question on the Q&A. Someone was asking, uh, is the Honor Film Initiative going to be rolled out this year? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, the Honor Film Initiative is well and alive. We're continuing to identify stories, commission films and all that, uh, and sharing our films online. And if anything, we find that inspirational stories are even more important now than ever. <laughs> I mean, from the looks of the panel and from what you guys are, are discussing, um, it looks like the impression I get is that probably within this group, um, SGIFF's uh, criteria for selection might be the most esoteric and wide. Um, you know, we have got commercial considerations, we've got shareability considerations, uh, we've got considerations of of uh, clarity of intent under the honor uh, perspective. So Ming, I mean, is it, would, would this actually imply that SGIFF's selection process is really, really wide and really you know, open to you know, bigger and larger and more different sorts of film? Um, I think um, different sections uh, require different consideration because every, every part works differently. So say for example, for our international um, sections or Asian sections, sometimes we program films that uh, people are really looking forward to. Some are um, hot titles and award-winning films from around the film festival. And when we know that there are little chance for those films to be released locally, but they are, they are sort of talking point films and they are the key films um, at uh, the, um, in, in the world cinema this year, then it's, for us, um, we want to show them. But then, of course, we also need to um, agree that they are good films, where um, the films are worth being seen and have a discussion. Sometimes I feel uh, films in the past, because this is actually, last year was my first year with um, SGF, but then as a programmer and um, head of programming in the past, I sometimes show films that I feel they may not be complete, where they may not be um, the best, but sometimes they open up um, spaces for us to think, where they may sometimes even stir up controversy, but then it kind of um, challenge us and keep us thinking and um, maybe sometimes some films actually were ahead of our time and we haven't get there yet. So some of the film, we watch it now and we were like, what on earth is this film? But maybe two years later, when you think about that film, that may be uh, the film you have finally understand and you want to revisit those films again. So it can be, for, for those kind of non-competition part, we keep our net quite wide. Um, we want to... Uh, sometimes we also choose popular films because, because as I said um, um, in the previous um, questions, we want to engage more audience. Uh, but the other ones that I usually uh, take control is the, uh, the competition part. So mm. the Asian feature competitions and the Southeast Asian short film, because I think competition are 
is actually the most important section for the um, for the film festival because it means what this film festival want to champion it means um it's either uh, the director is a future talent where something told um, in this film is really relevant and we should pay attention to uh, or it simply is just a fantastic great film so in a sense, um, what the other panelists has been talking about when they go through the film, there are several criteria they would look out for. For me, when I watch the film, I sort of usually went in um, with an open mind. I don't read the synopsis. I don't even know where the film comes from. And I tend not to know if the director has made three or four or however many films before. I just click the screening link and then start watching. And I feel um, I use my intuition to watch the films and that sometimes, and then as I watch the film, I will ask myself several questions. Um, it's like, why does he put the camera there? What exactly is this director want to tell? Why is that character do this rather than that? And then in the process, I mean, of course, when I think about these um, questions, when I think ask these questions, it's about if the director is good, uh, kind of telling the story and is what he wants to say a uh, kind of genuine exploration uh, of the thing and is it unique um, is it original is it something sincere and sometimes for me i feel i want to um, open myself to surprise um, and if the film even if it's not perfect but if the film show a sincerity and show the uh, filmmakers' willingness to try and take challenge and explore something unknown. Um, I'm, I'm, I kind of more open to that kind of film. But whether those films will go to the competition, then we have to uh, see as a whole. But um, these are the criteria and the uh, characteristics I would consider when I watch these films. Found Sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yes, right. When I was watching film, a lot of things going on in my head. So you've, you've almost, uh, you've, you've almost demystified, but also made it much more complex. <laughs> you know, in terms of actually, you know, uh, film watching and film patronage, you know, together with the pressure of selecting for the films, um, is is this a norm for a lot of the programmers? So, uh, I mean, could I actually say that? the thought process behind being a programmer is, is, is similar to what you've explained? I don't, I never actually ask anyone else. Um, okay. But it's like after watching, because every year uh, a programmer will watch, uh, I would imagine uh, at the very least six to 700 films, and that's feature uh, for screening link, for screening links, uh, and that's not short film. Um, but when you have so many films, if you actually, if you put like 90 minutes per film, then you would know that it's actually very, very difficult to go through these films. Yeah. So for me, um, I gradually developed a system that um, I would think about very quickly. I train myself, it's like unconscious. I train myself to um, evaluate the film within the first three scenes, where the first five minutes about uh, the director's skill, because uh, the mise-en-scene, uh, the camera yep. movement, and how the actors move, and the exactly what is the story. I mm -hmm. think very early on, um, I can have a basic understanding of um, where this director come from. Okay. And, uh, and and then you go on and see how how it goes, and then mm. so in the middle part, I will think about different criteria. Towards the end, I will think another thing. So that's how I work. But mm. when you kind of sit on the kind of jury deliberations or a program meeting, then you will realize everyone thinks differently. Then you start to argue. You start to say, "Wait, you didn't notice this?" Where someone else would say, "Well, you haven't watched that film, so he's actually doing something quite similar to." the other people has done, blah, blah, blah. So, mm -hmm. so it will be another process when you go through this program discussion. Yeah. Okay. So not as easy as, you know, having popcorn and, you know, oh. uh, <laughs> <or> beer. <laughs> Very cool. I mean, I'm, I'm actually happy that, you know, this has been 
uh, elaborated upon and also demystified because I think you know one of the biggest pressures you know uh, in the film so called circuit is actually the film programmer mm-hmm. um, that, that there's so many many things to consider and you know the uh, uh, a decision has to be justified in so many ways because there'll be like hundreds of filmmakers coming after you and say why did you choose my film <laughs> one one of the one of the topics that I had um specifically for this this subject is to also touch on how a filmmaker will prepare for its uh, uh for his his or her films uh festival run or festival events um could i actually put it to you guys to ask you know um if, again from different platforms perspective how would you advise filmmakers to prepare uh their films and themselves for your platforms maybe uh prashan i mean we can assume yeah. we can assume that it, it could be a feature film or a short film and you know uh i know we have had this conversation before that you are also actively looking for shorts to match uh some of the features that you have uh, that you're bringing in and yeah. there are also independent films that have actually approached you so how would i prepare my films you know be it short or feature to to work with a projector Actually, in terms of preparation, the, the marketability part of it is something that people tend to overlook. Um, a lot of times we also ask for, say, photo stills uh, or film stills, sorry, of the shows. Or, and, and the quality of film stills are sometimes the first step to selling uh, or to attracting someone to come and watch the film. If you don't even have quality photo stills, for example, that's already a problem uh, in terms of how we can market this. So uh, always have, even, even when you're producing, in the process of producing your film, be very clear that you will need to eventually market this to an audience uh, and, and what needs to be done in terms of marketing, now, whether it's you know, trailer cuts and um, you know, film stills and all these are important tools or assets that we need uh, in order to be able to market the film. So one step is for us to agree to screen your film, but the next step is we need to then take that film and market it to an audience who may not be familiar with who you are as a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you don't give us the tools for that, then it becomes an impossible t- or a challenging task now because then people are just, okay, let's trust them and go with this. Um, so for me, it's always, uh, especially with the projector, that marketability aspect is very important and, and make sure you don't forget that in your production process because sometimes then it's too late to go and you know try and capture these uh, captivating stills mm-hmm. okay yeah. how about how about vitsi i mean what what uh, there are some questions for vitsi but we'll we'll leave that to later um but how what how does vitsi uh, how do i prepare my film for vitsi do i knock on your doors or do i wait for you to to look for me you know um and i mean of course um, much later, we'll try to speak about festival strategies. I think that will be actually quite interesting to also share. But yeah, how do I engage VC as a filmmaker? I think um, the two scenarios that you mentioned has happened before. <laughs> there are some okay. people who knock on the doors. Uh, and then we also actively uh, work with a network of film schools and festivals out there uh, to kind of program like an online selection of films as well. Uh, and a lot of it, I think, on the early stages is driven from a word from mouth, a word of mouth promotion uh, with the filmmaker communities. Uh, so with one filmmaker submitting, he or she then knows that process of like, okay, I have to upload my video file, I have to attach subtitles, uh, attach my synopsis, film director, etc. The basic film details. Uh, mm-hmm. And then uh, once they submit it across, and then our team will then internally process the film pages to go ready uh, live on the platform. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and it's, it's, it's really, really getting... Vitsi to come on to come on board after they have actually run their festival strategies and 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 traveled so called you know the 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 award circuit so to speak. Would yeah, it, okay. yeah. Okay. I think we have see, we have observed that uh, for some of the filmmakers where they want to, I think have that ease of mind to make sure that they qualify for the festivals at the start uh, once they have completed their film. And then afterwards, then they explore like online distribution or any other possibilities to showcase their films out there. 
so yeah, it, it depends on the filmmaker's intentions. So. Okay. So again, we are hearing that, you know, filmmakers need to be informed and also need to, need to be knowledgeable in that aspect of planning what to do with their films. Um, I, I really want to talk about uh, Q&A sessions. Uh, so, I mean, again, uh, there are many questions, very interestingly. Um, I would like to quickly ask uh, Ming, you know, we spoke about this before. How, what are the minimum things that a filmmaker should prepare for their Q&A session? Okay, but before that, I just want to remind, because we were talking about how, how to approach an organization or a platform or festival. So uh, this one I, I want to um, put out. Um, next Monday, uh, 20th of April, the um, SGF start our call for submission. So um, prepare for your shorts, but then the deadline is not until 24th of August. So mm -hmm. it's still a while. But don't wait till the very last minute. Really, really don't wait till the very last minute because everyone will be very stressed. And uh, so if you want to get one advice, it's just don't wait till the very last moment because a lot of people would be like you. <laughs> and, uh, for, for preparing QMA, I think, um, I think Q&A is a very interesting part actually because you cannot, in a sense, you cannot hide. You are there and then everyone watch your film and um, they either love the film or hate the film or have questions about the film and you are there, they want to ask you. So I think it's the time to, um, to share what you have been going through uh, with this work. I mean, it may took you uh, three years, five years. I mean, some people take like 15 years to make their film. So, um, people would know when you do the QMA uh, whether you what what exactly you think about the film whether you are sincere with the work so i think when you go to the qma um be open uh, basically just be yourself and be honest with what you think about the film you made and um but i think prepare some basic questions um basic question is like almost everyone would ask uh, how did you come up with the idea how long uh, you have developed the film and um, why did you, if, if there's something very particular or very special about your film, then people are almost certainly going to ask, like, why did you choose to shoot this film in Vietnam, not in this place or not in that place? So those kind of questions um, people are bound to ask, um, prepare for those. Not, I'm not saying you will kind of memorize your lines and go on there and then take a piece of paper and start reading out your answer. but you don't go on stage and say, oh, I can't remember, it's probably five years ago, and my mom, oh no, actually it's my grandmom. And then it's just like, mm, is this your film? Yeah, mm -hmm. and then also, also it's like, um, people are starting to feel you are not so certain. So, and then also, I think another thing is because a lot of time, uh, the filmmaker, it will be the very first time when the filmmaker gets on stage, and filmmaker actually, uh, you, I, I have witnessed some of them have stage fright, so it's best to be prepared so you don't get on the stage and start to kind of freak out thinking, God, there are so many people out there, uh, and then you just go empty. So prepare those kind of very basic questions. As a moderator, I always, I actually always start with basic questions because it's the time for the filmmaker to get used to their own voice. Um, like, how did you come up with the story? And then you start talking and you start thinking, okay, this is my voice and that's the reaction from the audience, the light come from here. And then you kind of ease into the Q&A. And then mm -hmm. also, I, as a moderator, I usually ask two basic questions before I start talking about the specific. And by then, I think the filmmaker would have been more prepared and then you, you, you feel more comfortable to share. And then when I, um, if I open the, um, open the question from the audience, then you, you basically open yourself up. And I think if you don't really know the answer, sometimes maybe the audience will say, why your film doesn't talk about this is or that. And if you don't have answer for that, you just said, I haven't thought about that. Um, I would, um, I would take your uh, suggestion and, or I would, um, think about that for my next project or something like that. Hmm. Don't, don't be invasive and... Don't be, be defensive. Sincere. Yeah, be sincere, really. I think being sincere is the, is the best approach, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, again, from, from the Honour perspective, I, I know that uh, Honour actually does a Q&A session uh, together with the filmmakers and practically interviews them. So again, it's, it's a very good training um, um, opportunity for, for the filmmakers. Um, really, any, any ideas on that? I've seen Honour's uh, Q&A before and yeah, they're all pretty <laughs> spot on. <laughs> Yeah, so um, basically what we do is uh, once we've uh, selected the films uh, for, for a particular season of the Honor Film Screening, we actually uh, call in the filmmakers um, and we do provide, um, I guess, a, a very uh, guided interview session. Um, you know, uh, it's not live, so there's, there's a lot of opportunity for them. I mean, understanding that we're working with emerging filmmakers, a lot of them for the first time, many of them are students. Um, so we actually coach them. Uh, we provide that kind of like a media training, media coaching. Um, and so we capture, uh, we aim to basically capture kind of uh, them um, in the best light. Um, and help them to be able to articulate the intent behind the film, um, mm -hmm. the challenges that they have encountered in making the film, um, you know, what's their biggest takeaway uh, in making the film and what their aspirations for the film are. And mm -hmm. of course, you know, kind of what was the inspiration behind the film? What was it that they wanted to honour? Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so we kind of capture all that and we uh, basically piece, piece it together. And that's always, uh, I guess, one of the highlights of our honor film screening. So mm -hmm. uh, our honor film screening is never complete uh, without that compilation video of, you know, kind of like a director's, a compilation of, you know, like the director's statements mm -hmm. from each of our films. Yeah, and you can uh, watch that on our, on our website or on our YouTube channel. I, I think that is actually a very good uh, uh, step especially for emerging filmmakers because it's precisely that reason, uh, you know, making a film is always quite personal. Making a film, the, the, the clearer it is, the scarier it is, you know, because it opens up a lot of, you know, personal things. And to be able to manage a and a you know, without some kind of guidance is quite a feat. And I mean, again, honour being an end-to-end -end kind of solution, I think it's good practice ground before, you know, they venture forth to make even more complex films you know, for a larger audience. Uh, and, and this also kind of like answers the question about, you know, preparing uh, for your, for the, uh, preparing your film for the screen. Um, I'm hearing we have to get stills, we have to get our own, you know, marketing materials. Very, very important aspect. Um, let's look at some of the questions. Um, some of them are, again, quite mechanical, uh, which is actually something that we've mentioned about, you know, closing dates, uh, what are the kind of uh, definitions and criteria of selection? Um, uh, let's zoom in on some. Is it true? It's from anonymous. Um, is it true that for local filmmakers, it is harder to get opportunities for coverage or selection due to limitations and certain restrictions, restrictions such as no smoking on screen and no vulgarities? Fair question. You know, I I think this is this is worth some time straight from, you know, the programmers and the platform people. Is I think this... I'll, just, I'll just do a quick answer for projector side. I mean, for us, actually, that is not really a factor, but uh, because we are a public-facing platform, all our films need to go through IMDA. Um, so you just need to be familiar with what IMDA's, um, you know, rating uh, regime is. And as long as it can be rated R21 uncut, um, you know, we, projector will be comfortable to screen that. Um, so we generally don't do films that are edited or cut or required to be edited or cut by IMDA uh, just because, um, you know, I think we think that's, we don't want to promote that kind of behavior. Um, so for us, it's, as long as it can be rated R21 uncut, uh, we are comfortable screening that. So it doesn't matter whether you're smoking or taking drugs as long as, you know, uh, there's a point of view to that story. Uh, I think that we're fine with that. Mm -hmm. in, in the pro oops wow well, the question just skipped this this question this question has always appeared uh, and I've actually answered this before but again you know within the purview of all of you I, it, it's an interesting question to ask what other things can filmmakers do to increase their chances of being selected by a festival or is it just purely based on their film I see Ming shaking her head and 
it really, it really, it really is about film. It really is about film. I think um, uh, for me, I, this brings up my memory. Um, when I was in Taiwan, I remember I once had a three hours talk to film students about how to plan your film and then film festival strategy and things like that. And at the end, the, the student asked me, um, is there a specific thing, a subject or a topic, a film festival will always select? And I was like, did you not hear what I was saying for three hours? Uh, I, I think, I think, make, I think um, when you make film, you shouldn't think about your film uh, selectability. I mean, it's in all honesty, um, film programmers, uh, if, if we had enough experience, we would also spot that kind of film. And um, those kind of film can make people feel quite tired. Uh, meaning that if you don't do it sincerely, then um, you, you, you kind of um, exploit that subject. So I feel, uh, making a film, as a filmmaker, you should only have one criteria, is make the best film uh, you believed in. And don't think about what kind of films I should make, then um, it will give me better chance to get selected. I mean, I can't, I can't say like uh, when we select film, there are no other um, factors in mind, mm. but uh, a good film will always stand out. So uh, you should, put your effort in making good films, not thinking about what films will, what kind of film will get selected. I think it's very, that question is quite wrong, in all honesty, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a common question actually, because there's always this mystique behind uh, the film selection process. In an earlier question, uh, there, there was a question about uh, how short films are curated because, you know, um, there's implications of, you know, festival favourites and industry favourites. Uh, but, I mean, I, I like and I appreciate your answer because it really goes back down to the storytelling and I guess also what the filmmaker wants the film to be. Nikki, you were smiling also. You have anything to add from uh, Ming's comments? <laughs> I think um, it's, it's quite similar for the platform as well, uh, where we put story in its main focus. Uh, but at the same time, we also do observe some filmmakers who have submitted and gotten rejection before, but that didn't stop them from submitting like the next film and the next film. So I think the, 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 the mentality is that you, you always got to submit your film somewhere and to never stop trying uh, in that sense. It doesn't mean that a one-time rejection means a rejection for a lifetime, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was a very practical question here from uh, Tan Jun Sen. Um, I have a question for Ming and Prashant. If our work gets selected for screening at the festival and also the projector, how much money would we need to fork out for distribution? And let's say if we are students and we filmed it on, you know, typical low budget equipment and speaking as a student with no production experience. I, I think it's a nice practical question where we can probably kind of like shed some light. So how much money would it cost to actually distribute, you know, let's say for the festival run and also for a projector? Ming or Prashant, okay. whosever mic is unmuted. <laughs> okay. I'll start. I, in all honesty, showing your film at the film festival doesn't require you prepare any more money. But um, as Prashant said, uh, if you didn't have good steel, uh, good uh, film steels were, yeah, film steels, I mean, that is very, very important because to talk about marketing, you have to, you have to have the material. Otherwise, it's very difficult for us to promote your film. So sometimes uh, you would see some films keep getting promoted. Um, sometimes it's because their steels are so good. It's so eye-catching and like the color contrast is very good. The drama within a photo is so strong. People would just naturally stop and have a look. So think about stills. And then of course, once we select your film, your film has to be um, in a format that can be shown. So we can't say, for example, we can't uh, subsidize your DCP. When you submit your film, I mean, short film was a different format, but then for the feature films or feature documentaries, it's a DCP format, and then you can't ask the film 
festival to pay for your DCP. You can't ask us to pay for your post production. So those are the uh, those you need to budget in your production. I mean, other than that, um, I I can't imagine money you need to prepare if your film gets selected locally. I mean, if it's in other country, then you may need to fly. If you want to attend the film festival, you may need to uh, fork out your own uh, money if the yes. festival itself didn't pay for your flight or accommodation or things like that. But if it's for SGF and you're, if you're Singaporean, then I, I mean, for life of me, I can't think any, any kind of money you need to spend. I mean, unless you want to wear a nice dress or a suit because you want to show your parents where you're grandmom then kind of um, budget for that otherwise I, I really I really don't know I don't think there are money you need to pay for a film festival screening yeah mm -hmm. yeah well, I quite agree with uh, what Ming has said so basically I mean in terms of marketing it doesn't need to you don't need a big marketing budget there are a lot of creative ways to market your films uh, you know through social media and all I think also the point is just don't be too ashamed to you know, use your own resources or networks to market your films. Getting mm -hmm. selected is, is one step, but then being able to then, you know, you just putting yourself out there and talking to everybody about your films and, and pushing through your own networks without any cost. I think that's key in terms of getting more viewers and raising your profile um, as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't need money for that. You just need to, you know, your time and, and energy to do it. Let's let's talk a bit about um, festival strategies um, because it leads into this Vitsi question. Um, can we can we perhaps have some advice to filmmakers with their completed films? So where where would be some of the places that they can put their films to, or how should they think about their festival strategy? Um, maybe Ming can can give some advice on that. How would you advise? Um, a filmmaker on festival strategy? Where should it go first and next and next? I think uh, the first thing to understand is the premiere. Uh, the premiere means um, if you feel your film is suitable for a film festival, or if you want to at the very least give it a try, then um, film festival in general uh, have a premiere status. That means you shouldn't put it online. So say for example, the film is fantastic. Some of the films submitted, very few, but it still happens. Some of the films submitted is very good, but somehow the filmmaker has put it on YouTube six months ago. Then it's like it's automatically disqualified. Uh, we, we cannot show it because uh, the festival has a premier, state, uh, premier policy and uh, it's minimum Singapore premiere. So uh, you need to, if it's within Singapore and if you want your film to get selected, to be shown, if, to be eligible for SGF, then you need to, your first public screening will need to be uh, with our film festival. So um, what I mean is you may submit, I, I think this will be a, something quite useful to think about. Say for example, if you submit your film in June, and for example, in July, another organization asks you, uh, hey, um, we're organizing a event, film event. Do you want to show your film at our event? And you, when you have this dilemma because you haven't heard from us, and um, that's another opportunity for you to show your film, I would actually say you can write to us. You can write to us and say, I have this, um, this offer to show my film at the other place. Do you have an answer for my film? And sometimes, um, if you're really urgent, it's not only applied to Singapore films, um, some of the film other plays um, from all around the world as well. Um, they ask us to make decision early. And there's always a catch because if you ask us to make decision early, there is a possibility we may just say no. Uh, because if you're, it's, it's like, uh, we may still think about it, but you didn't give us enough time. Uh, so it's a, it's a chance you need to take. We may, be interested and then it you're forced to make decision uh you, then you lost the opportunity but what i'm saying is you can always write in to ask like mm. i need the answer within two weeks because sometimes when you don't tell us and then we select the film and we realize that your film actually was um shown at our other film festival 
Yeah. And um, th there may be a misunderstanding because you may not know that we are still considering your film. It's just we haven't made our decision, so we haven't notified you. So always check. And for the other film festival, for outside, um, outside Singapore, I mean, try, try the top one. Why not? Uh, like the, the, the kind of Clermont Ferrand where the Pusan in Asia, um, Pusan, Clermont Ferrand, where um, if it's Chinese language films, Golden Horse, where um, in um, Europe you have uh, kind of Cannes, Venice, I mean, I don't know if Cannes is happening. I mean, all those film festivals you can try and then you go tier, every tier down um, uh, and also think about regional premiere. Uh, basically, it means you need to, I once saw people's um, festival strategy was they're going to Cannes first and they're going to Venice second, where they're going to uh, Pusan first and they're going to Cannes later. It doesn't make sense because the film show that can't won't show in Venice. Yeah. And then uh, the film, if it's like some of the film festival wouldn't take a, a regional premiere uh, if they only ask for a world premiere or international premiere. So think about those. I mean, it's very broad. And then sometimes the, the strategy is very difficult to kind of conclude that within this um, amount of time. But ask people who ask around, ask other producers, ask other filmmakers, or um, people, I mean, sometimes, I mean, even us as Jeff, like, um, I have this film, uh, should I try here first or try there first? I mean, if it's a quite clear questions, we can, we can reply and then give you advice if we know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I want to segue this straight into uh, a Vitsi question for Nikki. Um, so it, it's an anonymous attendee. So how does VTC compensate its film contributors? Is there a monetization offer that has that? Uh, is there a monetization option for the films that have been submitted on the platform? Um, and before you answer that, you know, I, I want to segue this into what Ming has mentioned because uh, festival strategies and the process of exposing your film into the market is something that you cannot take for granted. Um, because again, that is how show business runs. Um, you know, making money from content is rather complex, I would have to say. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that Ming has actually kind of like segue into that uh, for, for Nikki to perhaps answer this question. Yeah, Nikki, please. Yeah, so um, I think in today, right, uh, in short, the answer is yes. Uh, we have opened up monetization option for the films that we showcase. Uh, I think from the start, from the very early days, uh, we are transparent to filmmakers to say that we don't offer an upfront fee for filmmakers. And then gradually, I think as the company also grows, uh, we wanted to also help explain our revenue model uh, arising from external distribution and creation or commissioning opportunities so that the filmmakers can also better understand uh, how the platform works. Uh, so to help clarify, right, the filmmaker license agreement uh, is a non-exclusive license. So you still maintain uh, non-exclusive rights for your film. Uh, you're free to also monetize or seek opportunities for your works uh, out there. Um, so then for us, we offer monetization through a revenue sharing model. Uh, through third party or licensing distribution deals. Uh, I think overall, we're trying to drive more towards a partnership model uh, with content creation opportunities and commissions. Uh, we didn't have the means to provide like direct monetary benefits right from the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. So now we have started pursuing uh, commercial distribution through our studios, our branded and partnership arms uh, to build up also a trusted partner network there. So then we can bring that value back to the filmmakers. Yeah. I, I think again, it's reflected on how the community kind of builds itself one block at a time to be able to gain enough, uh, almost uh, battle wounds and traction to, to sustain a, a kind of model. Because, um, I mean, if you go out with one short film, you know, it's, it's really, really very difficult. But if you go out and say that, you know, yeah, I have 50 short films and, you know, we can actually monetize the model. Um, it does make sense and when this sense makes money, it's really, really beneficial for everybody. Um, I mean, taking note, you know, intellectual property, uh, ownerships and all that. 
Um, I, I want to ask this question to to uh, honor Reeling. Um, you mentioned that uh, you're you're partnering up with the educational institutions, but I think the general public can also pitch for an honor uh, funding. If I'm not wrong, Is yeah, that's that's honor. right. Um, we actually uh, do work with um, young adult filmmakers. Okay. Um, and honestly, we've been quite flexible with the uh, definition of young adult. Um, yeah. So basically, we just, you know, um, uh, open up the platform to whoever has a story and wants to pitch it. Um, so I, yeah, I think, you know, just, just, um, just get in touch with us. Um, some tips I have uh, just now, John, you mentioned something about how do you approach the platform. Um, mm. I'd just like to maybe highlight, uh, you know, a couple of tips. I think one would be to attend the Honor Film Screening, uh, you know, which happens uh, once every six months, um, and to watch our Honor Films online. And the reason why I give that advice is because you kind of need to understand the types of films that get funded by this platform. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to understand the type of films that resonate with the honor audience, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be limited to these types of stories, but at least you can see what's been funded before. Um, and on the flip side, it also helps you understand which, what types of stories have already been told. Right, and that uh, can work to your advantage because it can help you understand how your film is unique and how your film can stand out. Um, yeah, so I feel like uh, these are these are things that um, practical things uh, that you can do because we do receive quite a number of you know um, inquiries, submissions, and all that. And sometimes you can tell, you know, like um, whether a filmmaker has done their their homework, their research, so to speak, and which mm -hmm. ones haven't. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like you need to kind of also find the right fit. You kind of need to understand, you know, what 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 this platform is about and assess whether it is the right platform for you. Um, and, you know, generally we are quite open. Uh, we have a pitch once every two months. Um, and so when filmmakers come for our pitch, uh, my advice would be to be open to input, right? So you may have a story that's very close to your heart, um, but also be open to input, be open to feedback, uh, because actually we are here to help you succeed. So we want uh, to enable filmmakers uh, to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, on, on that note, um, and in the interest of time, you know, we've got to sum it up. But again, you know, um, I, I would shout out to all the people who have asked questions. Um, again, you know, we will try to get back to you. Uh, but if you're an anonymous attendee, I don't know how to get back to you. Uh, so, you know, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, as a moderator and as someone who, who really wants this to be shared, I, I will try to get back to you uh, with, you know, of course, you know, the panelist's blessing. Um, so if you really want your questions to be answered or reflected, perhaps you should be known, right? Okay, um, nice, nice session. I like it. Um, okay, so what I'm hearing from, you know, our programmers here and our platforms is clarity of intent and clarity of story you know, from start to finish, you know, perhaps. Um, don't be shy in marketing your own films, you know, because you will also help the distributor for that. Embrace your tribe and that's why you go to the cinema. Embrace the familiar faces to talk and speak about films. Send in your festival entries early so that people can deliberate on them and get back to you as soon as they can. 